introduce to you Dr. Arvind Nagra, who is a paediatric nephrologist here, who I have the pleasure of working with in our joint transition role. So I think she's when lying. the patients get to uh, 18, they obviously have to move to adult services, and we have a, a really good setup here where I start to meet the patients from 16, get to know them in um, Arvind's clinic, and they go through their transition before they come to us. So for those of you that don't know, Arvind is the lead for transition for uh, the hospital, and she is responsible for the pioneering of a generic transition program called Ready, Steady, Go, which is used here. It's used nationally, almost. It's got nice recommendations. It's recognised in European countries, and it is all the work of this amazing lady who is an inspiration to work with and a fantastic talker. So I think you will really enjoy her talk. Yeah, build me up. I'm going to say great teamwork with Kirsten, who's helped for, um, us to develop the Hello to Adult Services and a phenomenal bunch of patients as well. Because remember, Nicole was with us when she was a lot younger as well. So really, because of a fantastic team and fantastic patients, it always inspires us to want to do more. So now, you might think, oh, transition, I'm switching off. We're not going to switch off because when you, when you hear the word transition, people think it's about young people moving from paediatric to adult services, but I'll show you how it actually um, is really relevant to your adult populations regardless of your underlying condition. Now transition's been around for a long time. There's this definition from the American group, Blue Metal, that um, talks about transition, and that's his definition, which different people think of it as different, as different things. But what I would say transition is, it's about empowering patients, equipping them with the knowledge and skills to manage their condition, both in children's services and adult services. And it needs to be a holistic programme that meets their medical, psychosocial and educational needs. So if you think about empowering patients and equipping them with the knowledge and skills to manage their condition, regardless of age, so it doesn't matter if you first diagnosed at five, 20, 30 or 80, everybody needs transition to be empowered. Now, often in children's services and in some adult services, they think they're doing transition and all they're doing is introducing them to the adult team, but with no patient empowerment, that is not transition. So the two bits of transition are patient empowerment and the second bit is making sure that the young person meets the adult team and that the adult team have the knowledge and skills to manage that young person, regardless of what their underlying condition is. Hang on a second. Okay. Since um, I don't know how many are renal here and who aren't renal here. Um, and the reason transition is important is because there's lots of evidence that shows that when young people move from children's to adult services, they do badly. Um, with the diabetes group up in the north of England, they found that young people um, were attending 96% of their clinic appointments, but when they were going into adult services, only about 50 to 60% were attending in adult services. And with that, there was worsening of disease control, more hospital admissions, and also an increase in, mort in mortality as well, which was really, really worrying. And it wasn't just unique for kidneys, um, sorry, for diabetes. They found the same uh, was true for patients with congenital heart disease. More were surviving into adult services, patients that didn't previously survive. And those that were moving to adult services, they found that the mortality rate was higher than it should have been. And they thought 20% of those patients, um, those deaths were avoidable, which is really, really worrying. The same is true for, for brains. And as it is a kidney, um, kidney day today, Alan Watson's group from um, the north of England in Nottingham transferred over a lot of 16-year-olds, um, 20 16-year-olds, to adult services, and eight of them, which is over th a third of them, lost their kidney transplant within three years of transfer to adult services. And of those eight, seven should definitely not have lost their kidney, which I think is really, really important. And that's a real, since we've been talking about resources this morning, I mean, that is a real waste of a resource. So we were doing something wrong, I think, in paediatric services. And so, and just, this is just to show that actually it's not just unique to the UK, it's, a, it's an international problem. And there's this group um, from Toronto that looked at their young adults that moved from paediatrics to adult services. And they looked to see how many lost their kidney transplant or died with the move to transplant, sorry, with the move to adult services with no transition. One in four lost their kidney transplant or died with no transition. But with transition, I mean, this is phenomenal the loss was zero, and that was by empowering patients. And the programme that they used is based on the Vancouver model, which is what the Ready, Steady, Go is based on as well. So the evidence is there that with patient empowerment, 
it does make a huge difference. There's lots and lots and lots of recommendations and documentations. Remember, Transition's been around since the 1990s and the, and the recommendations keep regurgitating themselves. And when you look at something from the early 2000s to now, it's the same recommendations they make. And what you'll find is that when you look at the best practice statements for whichever long-term condition you look at, be it diabetes, um, lup lupus, um, mental health, they have the same recommendations because any patient with a long-term condition, the majority of issues that need addressing are generic, with only about 10% being disease-specific. And Ready, Steady, Go is mentioned in the majority of these transition service specifications, allowing, because so many issues are generic, it allows for a generic program. Um, that you, you'll be familiar, some of you, with the CQC pond, from Pond into the Sea report that came out a couple of years ago and the recommendations in Recommendation 2, Ready, Steady, Go and the tools that help deliver it can deliver on the majority of those recommendations. The Health Foundation, again, talks about patient-centred care and I think um, Charlie was talking about patient-centred care and one of the things is empower patients and I was part of a generic transition service specification for, with NHS England and they too talked about patient empowerment. Now for those of the, within, within adults, it's not just for children and young people. In adults, there's this Institute of Public Policy Research document that came out a few years ago and that, that said that patients with a long-term condition, and they're referring to adult patients, should be empowered to manage their condition because they do better in the long term and it reduces cost to the NHS. And those were the recommendations that they made. And when you look at the top five recommendations there, they're the same recommendations that are being made in transition services for young people in paediatrics. So again, allowing for the same program to um, be, at, be there for all patients with a long-term condition. Personal health budgets, my husband will tell you, I am pants with my finances, so I know nothing about that. So I don't deal with that. And I, I ready, steady, go, I don't think can deliver on that. But then there's also the parliamentary groups have also been involved. So there's lots of people out there trying to see how we can improve long-term outcomes. And again, you need to make healthcare sustainable. You've got lots of projects that are pump primed, but when the money goes away, the project falls down and these patients are just left um, to their own devices and outcomes deteriorate again. And the parliamentary groups, whether you looked at the one for diabetes, whether you look for the one for um, HIV, and I've been involved with one for chronic kidney disease in adults, they make the same recommendations. Empower your patients. You need central resources of information so patients have access to the right information. You want to change healthcare professionals' behaviour. And by, by that, they mean um, we should be empowering the patients, not finding the solutions for the patients, but getting the patients to find their solutions and supporting them through that. And electronic patient-owned records. And we've got something called My Medical Record, which is a patient-owned electronic record here at Southampton that I think is spreading across the country. And that enables patients to access their clinic letters, blood results, appointments, and you can message in both directions. And it's really empowering to the patients. And in a recent one, going full circle, um, the Alan, uh, Alan Culver's group from um, Newcastle uh, had an NIHR funded grant that just, came, uh, that, that just came to an end, just a five year grant that just came to an end. And what they found when they looked at transition, the three recommendations that they made, there's lots of others, but the evidence that the evidence they found from their studies was that you need to promote young people to manage their conditions. So it's again, patient empowerment. You need to make sure that they meet the adult team prior to transfer, and which is a no-brainer, really. If you don't know your team and you've formed a relationship with your paediatric team, it can be really, really scary moving to a new environment. And I'm sure even as adults, we feel that as well. And make sure that they've got pr appropriate parental involvement and support, which you've been very lucky to have with your phenomenal mum at the back, so, as have you, Nicole. So I think it's really, really important that they do have family support. And to be honest, if you look at that, that's applicable to adults with a long-term condition as well. So, that gives you a little bit of background about what patient, what transition is and how Ready, Steady, Go might fit in. So you think, well, okay, so what is Ready, Steady, Go? It's a programme that empowers patients by equipping them with the knowledge and skills to manage their condition. It's a holistic programme and it's done gradually. And the way it does that is by it's working through a series of questionnaires. The questionnaires are not there as checklists, they're there as an opportunity to, um, to discuss these issues and um, you use it as a structured framework. So some of the questions, 
so there's some sections in there. So in the knowledge section, it's about knowing about your condition, what your medications are, who to contact for help. There's a fantastic bit on um, self-advocacy. It's about speaking up for yourself. And there's some great work from the north of England, um, the Aqua Group, and it's about called Ask Three Questions. And the Ask Three Questions, and I say this to my young people, even at the age of 11, I said, you know what? Whenever anybody says to you, I want you to start this treatment, let's smoke, ooh, let's have a baby. You think, you know, what are my options? What are the pros and cons of each option? And who can help me make the right decision for me? And I say to the 15-year-old boys and the girls say, let's have a baby. I say, speak to your mother. I'm sure she can help you make the right decision and not actually have a baby. But that really is very, very central at the moment. No decision about me without me. And then there's also, you know, the health and lifestyle, the sex, drugs and rock and roll. And this is just to show um, that the questions on here are very, very broad. So I'll give you an example here. And I know that sex has already been discussed this morning, but I'm going to just talk a little bit about sex because sex can be very difficult to bring up in a conversation. And I know that Katie was also talking about contraception. But there's a question here that goes, I understand the implications of my condition and drugs on parenting and pregnancy. So this is an opportunity for me if some patients are on MMF or if they're on enalapril, certainly for the girls, you need to say, you need to, you need to contact your medical team because that medication needs to stop because it's known to damage and harm the development of the baby and the baby's kidneys. So that is an opportunity for me to talk about the side effects of some of the drugs they're on. Also, you can talk about the inheritance patterns of certain conditions as well. Can you pass it on to future children? Um, and then I had this 18 year, well, he's 17 year young man that I see and I see with two of my male colleagues called, I'll call him Bob, I won't say his real name. And um, he gets retrograde ejaculation. So when he masturbates, um, he, it can be dry and I said, to to Bob, I almost gave his name away then. I said to Bob, you know, Bob, you know, you're 17 now. I said, are you masturbating? He's going, uh, are you Dr. Nagra? I said, um, so is it dry? And he's going, yeah, yeah, it's dry. And I said, well, how do you know that's a problem? And he goes, well, do you know what? My mates have, have been talking about dumping their load for the last two years and I haven't been dumping anything. And I said, <laughs> his words, not mine. I said, well, why haven't you mentioned it before? You know, you see my two male colleagues as well. He goes, oh, it's because I know you better, Dr. Nagra. And it's not because he knows me better. It's because I asked the question. And um, just to give you another example, it allows you to ask these difficult questions. So there's a haemophilia nurse. And haemophilia is a condition where if you bang your if you bang yourself, you can get nasty bruising. And she says, well, I can talk about the inheritance pattern, but I can also talk about, you know, um, you know, do you know, I didn't know this was an issue. And I'm sure lots of you don't know this is an issue if I didn't know it as well. Um, do you know the sexual positions that are safe to practice in haemophilia without hurting yourself? I thought, wow, I didn't know that. I said, well, that makes it less embarrassing. She goes, no, it doesn't make it less embarrassing, but it allows me to ask the question. And sometimes patients don't know what they don't know. Like the 16 year old cystic fibrosis boy whose parents are both GPs and he came to that question and he goes, ha 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 ha, I promise I won't get pregnant. And he looked up and saw the look of horror on the nurse's faces. And he goes, what? Well, cystic fibrosis boys can't have children naturally because all their tubes get, get very gunked up. And much better to find out at 16 than the 28 year old man with cystic fibrosis who only found out that he couldn't have children naturally after he got married and was very, very upset. So they need the support. Um, so this allows you to ask those questions. And this, oh, this is one, one of my epilepsy nurses. It allows patients to ask questions that have been playing on their mind. And she said she'd have never covered this in clinic, but maybe one of you guys would have done. She goes, well, I had this, well, she's 14, but we'll say she's 17 because it sits better. And um, it makes it more legitimate. Maybe she was 17, I got 14 wrong, just for the camera there. Um, and, and she goes, oh, do you know what? Because yes, she goes, if I'm giving my boyfriend a blowjob, she goes, what do I, um, she goes, if I feel a fit coming on, what do I do? <laughs> and the very sensible advice was, perhaps take him out of your mouth, actually, <laughs> would be a good idea. And maybe have this discussion beforehand and um, have a safe word. And if it's discussed beforehand, so it allows patients to ask the difficult questions. And she knows that would never have come up if it hadn't been there for that. So that's me finishing with the sex. I'm sure I've got other sex stories, but we'll finish with that. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll think I'm obsessed with sex. And my husband, I can promise you, will say, not interested at all. So there you go. <laughs> so we'll leave that one alone. So anyway, but then, but then, but, but going on to the serious stuff as well, it's also important to make sure that they 
achieve their full potential. So we talk about the education aspect of things as well. And lots of young people, certainly in paediatrics, because there's a large army base here, they want to make, they want to join the forces. And with their kidney conditions, they can't. So at the age of 11, I say to them, do you know what, you can do anything you want to do. You can go anywhere in the country um, to, to go to university, and we will support you with that, but you can't join the army, navy, or air force. And much better to break their hearts at 11 and steer them in another direction than at 18 when they've got their hearts set on it and they'll go off the rails. And certainly I've told that to eight-year-olds and their little faces, their little eyes just well up because they're so desperate. But it's, to, it's important to make sure they've got the right career choices and also important um, to make sure that they reach for the stars as well. Often they're allowed to fail at school because teachers say, oh, you've got kidney failure, it doesn't really matter if you don't come into school. But we need to make sure that schools are there to support them as well. And also with a lot of kidney disease and chronic kidney disease, we know that as the toxins build up, that cognition is slower and processing is slower. So you want to make sure they've got extra time in exams and things as well. So, and we're looking at trying to create a national letter for that. So everybody, there's no postcode lottery for that. We also talk about the psychosocial issues. Some people say, why me? It's not fair. And you want to address them early because you don't want them to stop taking their medications. And also with the medications sometimes, and I know that you were talking about this earlier, sometimes it can change your body body shape and your body image, you can get spots, you know, you can get put on a lot of weight and you want to make sure that they're addressed and the psychological support is put in early so they don't go off the rails. And there's a question here that talks about um, I am happy with life. And you think, what a trite question. Of course they're not happy with life. Lots of patients are happy with life, even with their chronic kidney conditions, because they've got a condition that they will manage and they live life to the full. But that's a question where I've had a patient go, yeah, 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 life is great. Actually, do you know what? My life is shit. You know, I've got scars all over my body. I'm never going to get a girlfriend. I'm never going to leave home. I'm never going to do anything. And what we did is we put psychological support in, turned him around, and what he's now doing is, doing nursing, doing fantastically well, has a girlfriend and is living away from home. And we wouldn't have known that if that question hadn't been there. And then we also talk about transition. And remember, transition is about you learning about your condition so that when you go to adult service or in adult services, you've got a voice and you can actually hold the doctors and nurses and everyone to task. With the second bit of transition being you meet your, you meet your team as well and make sure that the team are ready. So when do we start? Some people might say, oh, well, we start at 11, they go, wow, 11's a bit early. But if you think about it, it's not too early to start um, empowering patients. And certainly, I've got seven, eight-year-olds that can tell me the names of their um, kidney transplant medication. So it's never, too, it's never too young. They're like sponges, but formally, they start the Ready, Steady, Go program at 11 because they're moving from junior school to senior school. They're feeling like big boys and girls, so they're ready to take on more responsibility. And if you think about it, if you start early, then you can address issues in small, bite-sized chunks, and you can equip them with the knowledge and skills to manage their condition. So that gives you a little bit of information about Ready, Steady, Go. And now I'm going to let you listen to some patient voices about Ready, Steady, Go. And then I'll talk about what's happening locally, nationally and in the future. And then I'm going to get you guys to give something back by showing you a little video at the end that I just want you to answer some questions on. Not this one, though. It's a programme that's designed for young people and the idea of the programme is to empower young people to equip them with the skills and knowledge. So it's about them taking control and managing their healthcare. And what studies have shown is that if you equip them with these skills, they do much better in the long term. I'm Maria. I was first diagnosed with kidney failure when I was 10. I was really scared and worried at that point, but later on, thanks to Ready, Steady, Go program, I later found out that it's called HUS, and I was able to understand what my condition is and what the symptoms are, and I can look for that in the future, and it's all thanks to Ready, Steady, Go program. I was introduced to Ready, Steady, Go program by having a leaflet, an information leaflet, and then my next appointment I had the Getting Ready questionnaire, which is the red one, and then years later I had the Amber, which was the Getting Steady, and then a couple of years later I had the Green questionnaire, which was the Go, and we covered all the questions, making sure that I actually knew them instead of just blagging my way through. 
So when Marie went to adult services for the first time, she um, felt really confident, she felt prepared. Also, now that she's living away from home, she has all the confidence because she knows about her condition, she knows that she can go anywhere and if she becomes ill or gets any symptoms, she knows what to do. She has that developed now so that she can seek help and I know that she'll always go to her hospital appointments because she knows it's important to do so. I'm Daniel, I'm 14 and I have a heart condition. The Reset and Grow program has taught me the three rules, which are what are the options, what are the pros and cons, and who can I ask for help. That applies to all medical decisions that I have to make and about other stuff in life. This includes things like career choices and other things. My name is Ben and I get a poor stomach and it lasts a long time and I'll have it until I'm a dog. When my doctor said that I'm going to start the Ready Steady Go program, I was a bit nervous at first, but then I saw the questions and I realised they weren't that hard and I'd be ready in the next seven years. You start with Ready and then after a couple of years you go on to Steady and then by the end of it you're on Go and I've got seven years to do it. By the time that I get to go, I'll be able to look after myself with, and learn what my um, problem is and know who to contact. I'm 16 and I have asthma and at times allergies that are quite difficult to control. In the Ready Steady Go program, I was always encouraged to talk to people on my own and as time went on I got more and more comfortable as they explained my right to confidentiality and, and that allowed me to talk about some rather difficult issues and problems that I wasn't comfortable talking about in front of my parents. I'm Marie and this is my daughter Daisy. Daisy was diagnosed when she was 12 months with bilateral retinoblastoma, which is a genetic form of eye cancer. She now faces a lot of long-term and permanent side effects from the treatment. So there's an awful lot for her to get her head around and a lot will impact on her future in decisions that she makes um, throughout her life, really. I think the Ready Steady Go programme is absolutely brilliant because going into the adult services terrifies the life out of me for my daughter. So knowing that there's support out there for me and the family with respect to that and for Daisy is brilliant. And what really puts my mind at rest is knowing that there's an adult programme, Hello to Adult Services, that will allow that smooth transition through into adult services. I'm a mum to Sam and Dylan, who's his twin brother, who are 14. Boys are on the Registrative Bro program, which I am actually doing for them because they're not able to advocate for themselves, therefore I'm doing it as their parent. We are delighted to be on the Registrative Go program as a family, myself, the boys and my husband. We're gaining the skills and the knowledge to move forward into adult services and we know that when they do eventually go into adult services we will have the skills and the knowledge to manage and care for their conditions and the boys themselves. I'm Michael, I'm 13 years old and I have had a kidney transplant. When I started really scared going, my mum was worried about me being responsible for my medicines and Ready Steady Go has helped me become more responsible for my own medicines and now I can name them all and I know what dosage I take them with. I think the programme is encouraging my mum to step down from it and let me take over. I'm 17 and I had osteosarcoma when I was 7. The Ready City Go questionnaire has made me realise that I didn't actually know everything about my condition and it made me consider things that I hadn't really thought about before that were still to do with my condition but about completely other things in general life. The programmes helped me to answer the questions from doctors but also to ask my own questions because before I would have said to my mum before we went in asked her to ask the question for me but now I'll ask my own questions and be more involved in what's actually happening with my condition. So, I hope you found the patient voice very loud then. The patient voice is very strong and I can introduce young people to the programme. I can introduce them through a leaflet but the patient, when they see that video, patients and families want to go on to the programme. And, um, 
And there was a, the young man, Daniel, who you may remember has got learning disabilities, the one that said the asked three questions with a cardiac problem. I bumped into his mother about a year after he'd been on this programme. And she said, you know, what? I'm so glad he was on the programme. She goes, we had to go to the adult services. And he was 14 at the time. And she goes, we didn't know. We thought it was just an appointment just to have a little chit chat about him moving to adult services. And um, the doctor there said, you know what? You've got a heart condition and you're going to need an operation. But it's up to you whether you want to have this operation. And she thought, oh, my God, I didn't even prepare him for this. And he's a boy with learning disabilities. And she thought, he's going to have a meltdown. She goes, he took a deep breath. And she goes, here it comes. He goes, well, what are my options? What are the pros and cons of each option? What's right for me? And the adult um, um, cardiologist was lovely and went through everything. And then, obviously, she goes, he didn't make the decision on his own. She helped him, but it gave him a voice because suddenly you're allowed to ask those questions, which I think is really, really important. So... This is just, to, so that just gives you a background of what Ready Steady Go is and how you, what can be achieved. And this is how we work through the programme. I'm not going to go into it in detail. In adult services, we have a hello to adult services programme that Kirsten was instrumental in helping us develop. Because when our young people, when a young person of mine, so she's an inspiration to me as well, um, Kirsten. When a young person went to adult services and she had learning disabilities, Kirsten's comment was, wow, your patient with learning disabilities knows a lot more than our patients that haven't got learning disabilities. And my comment, because uh, I must have had a long day, was, well, that's a poor reflection on you guys, actually. Um, I said, shall we develop, you know, shall we, you know, you've got the same issues that need addressing in adult services and chatting together, we found the solution. Well, why don't we adapt the Ready Steady Go programme for use in adult services. So to make sure there was no north-south divide, we got the north of England involved with the south of England in terms of renal. And then we also got other specialties like adult cardiologists and patient groups, respiratory groups involved. And that's where the Hello to Adult Services programme came in place. And the questions are, are, are the same almost. So how do we work through? Patients work through it at their own pace. In adult services, they'll work through it much, much quicker. And what happens in, is as they work through the programme, um, the questions become a little bit more complex. So in the getting ready phase, it's I understand my condition. In the steady phase, it's I understand the medical words, terms and procedures relevant to my condition. And then by the time they get to go, it is I I'm confident in the knowledge about my conditions and management. And then you keep checking in with the... Um, blue one when they move to adult services you've got to be kidding me don't be bonkers you said you'd give me extra time so I'll, I'll take extra time. don't be oh in that case so anyway but but basically issues are addressed in small bite-sized pieces and what you'll find is that as you go you're already addressing a lot of the you're already addressing a lot of the issues in clinic so it just gives you a structured framework and patients like to be on that structured framework does that make sense so yes so you might think, oh, it'll take a long time. It's the red bits I'm picking up because they're the bits that people say, oh, no, we're not interested. Time issues. It took a long time to introduce the programme, but with the video, it shortened time. And in the long term, um, what some people were also doing, they were trying to do everything on the questionnaire in one go. And if you try and do that, you're going to fail. Learning disabilities, patients do as much as they're able with the parent doing the rest of it for them because the parent's going to be part of the patient voice in adult services and they're going to be their, they're going to be their advocate. The diabetes data showed very similar to the earlier data from the diabetes group is that by starting Ready Steady Go and they only had a chance to do the go, they found that it halved the number of hospital emergency admissions and also um, it increased the number of patients attending adult services. They've started the programme earlier in the diabetes group and there's now also a downward trend in their um, HbA1c control. By the time you're 14, it's already going in the wrong direction. We also cohort clinics, Kirsten and I, and if anybody wants to talk about that, we can talk about that later. But implementing change is difficult, but you can do it. This is just to show that these are some, I mean, I got bored, so I, I stopped putting the dots in. It's been picked up across the UK, across the four nations. And for those units that use a transition tool, 96% are using Ready, Steady, Go. And that's over a third of um, renal units across the UK. And those numbers are increasing all the time. As Kirsten said, it's, been vo it's, it's, it's recommended in NICE. It's been voted the best transition tool. And we've got an app as part of Ready, Steady, Go, as part of my medical record, which those patient-owned patient records. We've also developed a Hello to children's and a hello to adult services program and one of the first things that it says on there i'll just show you this the patients love it 
What it says is, we understand that learning you have a long-term condition can cause anxiety and be overwhelming. And the number of patients where their eyes just lit up with relief that it's been recognised is phenomenal. And we've got the R3 questions as part of that um, leaflet, information leaflet. We've got an easy read version. We're creating central resources of information um, with the BAPN. So patients, healthcare professionals all go to one area so that the same information is being given across the country so there's no postcode lottery. So I am going to get one thing from at the end, just the video. So this is just to say it's a generic programme that works across subspecialties. It's about empowering the patients and it works because everybody understands the um, traffic light system. You just pick it up the shelf, whether or not you've got a whole team around you and you can just start using that structured framework. Now, this is a two minute video. This is, this is important because this, this day here is going to make a huge difference nationally because together we can make a difference. I'm going to show you a video, nothing to do with a very rare condition. And my question to you is, should we be developing resources like this for use in the future? So you've got your little questionnaire, so I'd like you to fill those in, but have a look at this. You'll just need to say who you are and now watch the video. Oh, together we can still make a difference. Here we go. No, hang on, I've got to just do this. What is nephropathic cystinosis? It's a rare condition that you won't come across very often. It's a rare condition caused by a defect in a gene called CTNS. Nephropathic cystinosis is a condition that affects the whole body. The early symptoms of the disease affect the eyes and kidneys. This disease causes a problem in a cell structure called lysosome. The lysosome is a structure within each cell of your body where proteins that are ingested with the food eaten every day are broken down into their components, the amino acids. Once broken down, certain parts of the proteins, called amino acids, can be recycled. One of these amino acids is cysteine. Within the lysosome, two molecules of cysteine come together to form a new structure called cysteine. In healthy cells, cysteine leaves the lysosome via a specific transporter located in the walls of the lysosome. This transporter only transports molecules of cysteine and is the only available exit option for cysteine from the lysosome. In patients with cystinosis, the cysteine transporter does not work and cysteine cannot leave the lysosome. Cysteine therefore accumulates in the lysosome. Once it has reached a certain level, it starts to form crystals. These crystals harm the cells, which results in damage to the body. This results in a number of potential problems in the body, such as severe kidney problems. Cysteine crystals form in every cell of the body, therefore a lot of other organs are also affected. For example, patients with cystinosis often have crystals in their eyes, making them very sensitive to light. Fortunately today, nephropathic cystinosis can be treated and many of the symptoms can be delayed. <coughs> okay, so that's the video finished. And then my question to you guys is, do you think a video similar to this should be developed for your condition, for all conditions? Um, and it can be in small bite-sized pieces. Do you think it is not necessary to have a video if you've got a leaflet? And do you think we should have a repository where we go to so everybody, whether you're in primary, secondary, tertiary care, whether you're a GP or whether you're a patient, that you all go to one area to find your information? Thank you. So thanks for that. Drink and be merry, guys. I apologise if I've overrun. I knew I shouldn't have talked about sex. OK, so thank you very much to Arvind. Um, as you will have gathered from the first part of her talk, I've learned a lot from sitting in with Dr Nagra in her clinic. And my embarrassment at questions has <laughs> had to go, having watched her in action. So has anybody got anything they'd like to ask? Any questions? Any? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yes, all the, all the resources are on the website and they're print ready and you just print them off and you start using them. I've had parents say, my, my doctor wouldn't start, me, start my daughter on it. So I've just printed it off and I'm working through it with her. Yeah, and you, and you should have one for each one and each of, this, each of them should be doing it. And we've got my, ask them about my medical record and ready, steady, go. And you ask for them because you've got a voice. It's really important. Any other questions? One, two more questions and that will be it. So one here. 
Oh, yes. Well, well, you like that because it's already up in adult services in Salford, and we would in here at Southampton. Uh, it was agreed that they would put it in all patient contact areas. That was the agreement. But because they haven't, with the introduction to Hello to Adult Services, it's in there as part of the leaflet. For adult services, where people have necessarily transition, so Oh, no, no. No, it's for, if you're diagnosed with a long-term condition, if you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, it's for any age group. It's not just for those moving from children to adults. The Hello to Adults is specific for adult services. And the adult services that have picked it up are using it in their older population. And what they're also doing is they're trying to get their paediatric counterparts to pick up Ready, Steady, Go. And that shows the power of the programme. It's very simple. And when you look at it, you'll be addressing a lot of it already. And we'll be, ad we'll be developing resources so you can signpost because the patients need this information. And if they're not getting it, well, I think we're failing them. And we just have one more question over here. Thank you. Um, did you find that the, once you've got the register <coughs> in place, that you had less parents, um, or parents were happy to release their children? Yes. Involved, yes, it was, it was, when they see it, they think, oh God, and they look at the question, they go, actually, they're not bad, that's fine. And it's just, if you've got that relationship with your patient, you can do that, and it's simple. There's only one patient that said no, but the rest of them, yes. So it's fine. And, um, and when patients see that, they go, oh, thank God, we're going to have a holistic programme. I tried it on an octogenarian, and she goes, I said, but what about the job bit? She goes, not applicable, and looked very smug. I didn't ask her about the sex, I thought that was too much for me. But everything else, even the elderly like it. And if you've got Alzheimer's, you, their carers can work through it. Okay, yeah. so Thank you. Thank you.